There's something undeniably appealing about moving to the country, the kind of place where the only commuters you're going to contend with are a family of deer, where all natural turkey has nothing to do with nitrates and processing, but just means turkey in its natural habitat. Squirrels are you coming to? Or at least that's what appealed to Kirsten and Christopher Shockey. They moved from Corvallis to the Applegate Valley in 1998 in search of a simpler life. Especially as, you know, the kids were starting to grow, I just wanted them to be grounded. I wanted them mm-hmm. to have a connection with the land. And it was, it was a deep pull that I can't explain. And I wanted them, uh, more than anything, to know where their food came from. The idea was to get their 40-acre homestead to pay for itself which turned out easier said than done. Their first thought was a vineyard, but everyone else was doing it. Then they decided to make cider, but it was going to take years for the apple trees to mature. So they tried a dairy. She's a Dexter, and a Dexter is an older breed that was multi-purpose. But they couldn't grow enough fodder to feed all the livestock. Huh, Barca. But she loves hay. Meanwhile, they got a crock of sauerkraut as a gift and started making it at home. It turned out to be a crock of kraut that changed their lives. And then we thought we should launch our olden labels, so we did. We schlepped a lot of sauerkraut to farmers markets (laughs) back in the day when it wasn't sexy. (laughs) Got a lot of yucky faces. Before it was cool, a lot of yucky faces. (laughs) At the time, most Americans associated sauerkraut with that canned goop served at ball games. But like the pioneers who came to the Applegate Valley before them, the Shockies were resourceful. You know, you can ferment these little seed pods, too. Really? They saw the process that makes sauerkraut, called fermentation, as a way to literally bottle the beauty and the bounty of the landscape around them. Super peppery. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. So good. I'm going to have to stop eating them, though. Yeah, you are. Pretty soon, they were fermenting anything and everything neighboring farms grew in surplus. We created vegetable recipes that maybe didn't have a cabbage blade in them at all, and so the idea was really working locally. She did 52 varieties in one year. 52. Finally, Christopher said they should write a cookbook. Kirsten's response? It's been done. The only fermentation book out there at the time was Sandor Katz's Wild Fermentation, so his small one. Christopher plucked it off the shelf and came back to me and said, yeah, but there's only 17 pages on vegetables. <laughs> and so... They released fermented vegetables in 2014, helping to propel the fermentation wave that swept things like kimchi, kombucha, and kefir into mass culinary consciousness. The book has now sold more than 100,000 copies worldwide. It just came out in German. So there are, there are Germans who are learning how to make sauerkraut. <laughs> from a couple of hippies in Oregon. (laughs) Now they travel the world, teaching their Oregon-grown gospel of fermentation. So I'm gonna start with these little guys. But what exactly is fermentation? I'm gonna pickle these before you eat them all. That one seems too small to... (laughs) It's an ancient form of pickling, where instead of adding vinegar, you get the microbes that naturally occur on the veggies to do the work. It starts with adding a salt brine, because a saline environment gives the good bacteria an upper hand over the bad ones. Or in the case of things like cabbage and basil, the veggies can make their own brine. Give me a nice sprinkle. So this is the magic. We're going to take a whole bowl of basil and massage that salt in. (laughs) It's just pretty amazing out of basil. You can get that much brine coming out of there. The microbes then go to work making the lactic acid that preserves the food. This is how Christopher likes to explain it when they teach classes to kids. I tell them that we're going to use microbes, little teeny tiny guys, guys that you can't even see. And their job is to eat the sugars, and they're going to make acid, which is that sour taste that you taste, and they're going to fart CO2. And then usually the kids are like, oh my god, is it going to be smelly? It's like, yeah, it's microbe farts. Of course it's going to be smelly. It might be smelly, but as the Shockies like to point out, it's also good for you. Scientists are finding that the microbes themselves, called probiotics, are beneficial. And as they break down the food, they add extra vitamins. Unlike freezing or drying, fermenting also preserves the volatile oils that hold in the flavor. So it's like you're taking this smell and this harvest of right now, and you're going to capture it in that jar. 
The Shockey's first two cookbooks were about vegetables and condiments. Now they're releasing a book on beans and grains and creating recipes for the next book, which returns them to Christopher's early idea for their homestead, ciders. So we'll start with this guy. And so I'm, I'm looking for this guy, the elderflower, to see when we bottled it before and what I'm expecting it to taste like. And then I'm going to write down what it actually tastes like. All right. Yikes, there it goes. That's funky. <laughs> Crafting new recipes is a little like being culinary mad scientists. Christopher thinks the elderflower cider needs more time to mellow. But another wow. test with rose petals from the garden is ready to bottle. That's crazy. I like it. Oh, I think it smells like grandma. The Shockies may come up with recipes, but what they really hope people take away from their books and classes is this playful willingness to experiment with fermentation. So what I've seen is this explosion of creativity. People all over the country and all over the world saying, wow, look, I can use this method, this, this thing that has worked, you know, since people had a vessel and some salt, really. And look what I can do with it. Look, the, look at the flavors that can happen. In the end, the Shockies didn't end up making a living off the lamb by growing or making the food like they originally thought they would, but by sharing it with a new generation of probiotic pioneers. Oh, here's one more little piece of broccoli. Boom. 